Good morning. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Aisha and Cody for having me here. When Chris asked me to speak uh, last month, it was at my brother Ian's uh, conversation at Creative Mornings. When he was talking about movement, Chris came and said, Anthony, next month we're going to be talking about acceptance. Do you want to do it? Of course, there was some hesitation. There was also some resistance, but for some reason I said yes. And then a couple of weeks ago, me and Chris, we went out for um, coffee. And during our conversation, Chris asked a question that took my breath away. He said, how do you continue to practice acceptance in the midst of difficult realities? And um, talking to Ro this morning, she said, your life has been a practice of acceptance. I think it started for me when I was around six or seven years old. And this week I've been going through the annals of my life's history, trying to figure out which one I want to talk about. But I mean, if you guys haven't noticed, I'm black. So my experiences are very colored, very painful. I mean, I'm like for real, for real black. Grew up in a single mother home black. Grew up in the hood black. Didn't like to play sports. All I wanted to do was read music. And I'm, well, I do know how to read music, but read books and learn how to play instruments black. So the guys in the neighborhood, my brother especially, wanted to rough me up so I had to go out to the street and learn to fight. That kind of black, patriarchal masculinity, traumatization kind of black. So those experiences really informed the way I approach life. And um, I guess I can start in 2015, really. This was the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, Trump was just about to announce his presidency. And Mike Brown, we had Eric Garner, um, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland. We had a lot of different deaths and I was navigating a white male dominated space. I was in the military and I would come to work sometimes and instead of acknowledging me and recognizing me by my rank, they would say, what's up, thug? And so all of this internalized rage from childhood, being in unhealthy relationships, they all started to converge and bubble over. And so I did what a lot of people do, I guess. I ruined a, re a relationship. I got divorced. And that was because one day I looked in the mirror and I did not recognize myself that playful young man who was always curious. I was becoming more and more hardened by my experiences. And I had to confront that uncomfortable reality that I had created really. And so I started to develop tools. I went to therapy. I started to practice meditation. I found my way to a yoga mat. I started to read self-help books. I started to really scavenge and rediscover the parts of myself that was buried in the rubble of my childhood. And so acceptance for me really means not resisting. Yes, it may be uncomfortable. Yes, it can be ugly. Sometimes you might have to sit in it and cry in it. It may almost cause you to lose your mind. But on the other side of that pain, on the other side of the shame and the guilt, you can find some semblance of peace and sanity. Now, as I said, um, I'm a black male. And since I've been back in Chattanooga for about five years now, I don't know why 2018 feels like it was last year, but I've been back for quite a while. Um, I was connected to a lot of creatives. One being a black woman who is really the mother of creatives. She provided me with the platform, Midnight Meditations, Erica Roberts, everybody please give it up for her. Thank you, Velvet Poetry. She provided a platform for myself and my sister Ro to come and talk about our experiences, but also to provide tools. Everybody give, give it up for Ro as well. I'm making a mission to elevate the black women who have been influential in my life like my sister and of course my wife, but we'll talk about her a little bit later. Um, and of course my mom. But these black women saw something in me, saw me deconstructing masculinity, working through my trauma, developing tools that I could give back to young men like Christian and Landon, my students, former students at Howard, who are here tonight. Give them a round of applause for today. These tools that I developed throughout my life, like when I was six, I, I was diagnosed with ADHD. So I would be in class, you know, of course, impulsive yelling out, 
while the teacher was talking only because I was trying to let them know I'm free and your rules will not contain me. Okay. But, but I had to learn self-control. I had to develop tools where I could behave and really show my intellect. So I would sit in class and I would tell myself in my mind, I would play. I would say, move, don't move. Move, you better not move. You better not move. Move, get up, don't do it. Don't do it. And on the outside, it would just look like me sitting there like this. But really on the inside, of course, I was playing this game of hopscotch, seeing how I could develop the tool of self-control and discipline. And so that has informed how I raised my children. Um, and in the bio, it said that I'm an equity trainer, right? So my role with the Chattanooga Racial Equity Collective, which has since disbanded, that role was to get everybody on the same page before we started to talk about something uncomfortable, which was race. Race is an uncomfortable topic. We have to filter through white guilt, white shame, black pain and black struggle. And sometimes we enter the conversation with preconceived notions, with judgments, with expectations, and we put up walls. So the first thing that I did during this season, and we did all of this during COVID, which is what I want to do here, is I want to take a brief moment to check in. I want everyone to close your eyes and check in with yourself. What are you bringing into this space? What feelings, thoughts? Really investigate it. And maybe you take a couple of breaths to center yourself and to ground yourself in this present moment. Because one thing I found about acceptance is the enemy of acceptance is resistance. And we're re when we're resisting, we find ourselves utilizing our creativity and our imagination in unhealthy ways. We create storylines. We get attached to the way things should be. Our expectations are out of whack. And we find ourselves falling victims to illusions. Which is an unhealthy use of creativity and imagination. All right, bring yourselves back. We're gonna save that energy closer to the end of this talk. We have a 10 minute meditation to sit through. It's gonna be great though, I'm gonna guide you through it. So when we're resisting, there's this uneasiness within us and we find ourselves mindlessly moving and shifting through life unconsciously. And before we know it, we look up and we're lost amongst the trees. And we find ourselves trying to get over instead of getting through. And the difference between that is, say for instance, you're on a plane, you're flying over a forest. You see the totality of it, right? But if you were on the ground and you spent days trying to get through the forest, you develop certain techniques. You learn how to strategize. You learn, to, you learn from your mistakes. You learn how to maneuver. You really get to test yourself, test your grit. And so that's what the practice of acceptance is for me. Learning how to navigate the forest of life, this journey, this long, 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 tedious journey. The life expectancy right now is what, 75 years old? But if we break that down to moment by moment, moment by moment, where we are asked to be conscious and aware, it's a long, long life. Each day is long where we can learn to sit and be with ourselves and learn to be with others. So this resistance that we create separates us from the present moment, but it also separates us from life. And life is where we want to be. The human experience is colored with uncomfortable experiences, 
but it is rooted in suffering. And as the Greeks say, we suffer our way to wisdom. So when I was younger, I asked God to give me wisdom. And the Bible says that if we ask for wisdom, God will give it to us freely and in abundance. So I guess that means that I got a, a lot more suffering to go through. But I willingly show up for it. And hopefully today you will begin to develop and utilize tools that can help you show up in your own suffering and learn to be content in it because I have to go to work after this and that's a form of suffering. <laughs> Some of the suffering that we do, it can be as voluntarily, like when we go to the gym or as Ian does when we go or Chris, when we go run 10 miles or as Kessler does when he's sitting at his computer playing guitar for 13 hours trying to find the right melody or as Landon and Christian do as they're learning to program drums, that suffering is voluntary and some suffering is not. Sure, we may choose to get in a relationship, but the ending of that relationship sometimes feels like it's out of our control. And my first experience really with letting go and relinquishing control was 2017 coming back from my last deployment in Japan. Now, how many of you like to fly? Raise your hand if you like to fly. I'm sure you like to travel, but who likes to fly? Okay. How many of you like turbulence? How many of you have ever been on a plane that, that was about to go down? Okay, that was my experience. So I asked God for, for wisdom, right? And I was at, at this time, I was leaving the military, so that was that transition, but a relationship was ending. And right before I left, the day before I left, I found myself on the bathroom, unable to confront and embrace that reality. And I was thinking, well, since I can't embrace this one, I'll just go ahead and check out. I didn't, of course. So the next day I'm flying out. Before I, the plane takes off, the plane gets on the intercom. We're going to be experiencing some strong winds as we enter Tokyo. I was on the island of Okinawa. We had to fly into Tokyo to get on the big plane to fly back to the States. We're going to be experiencing some strong winds as we go into Tokyo. Flight was okay. Then we started to enter into the territory of Tokyo. You can feel the wind starting to pick up. The plane is rocking. Okay. I'm like, okay, I can breathe through this. This is a little bit of turbulence. Then we start to land. It comes on the radio. Everyone buckle up. Okay. As we start to descend, the wind gets stronger. Now the plane is, is doing this. And I'm still sitting there like, okay, we have to land. And then the plane says, Phew. I look over to my left, there's a baby who's crying. I'm like, okay, surely God, this baby is on a flight. You're not gonna kill this baby. I'm safe. You're not gonna kill the baby. This baby has to grow up. But then I'm also confronted with Thoughts that I was not thinking of when I was in my own head trying to end my life the day before. I'm like, okay, what if I never get to see my daughter grow up? What if I don't get to walk her down the aisle? I want to see her go to prom. I'm thinking of all of these things. So we're now we're landing. And the plane is doing this. Somehow the plane turns on its side. The wing scrapes the ground. And I'm looking at it all happen out the window. And then the plane takes off again. And then that moment with so much fear. Everyone on the plane crying, afraid, like fear, was gripping their face and they had to confront the uncomfortable reality of death. In that moment, I was like, you know what? I can't get to the pilot seat. I don't know how to fly a plane. It is what it is. It is what it is. But in that moment, ironically, I felt so much peace. I let go. I mean, and eventually the plane landed. And when I got off, I fell to my knees and kissed the ground. But Confronted with so much fear, discomfort, and relinquishing control, there was no, no other choice for me but to let go and to find peace. I accepted that I could not fly the plane. And in that moment of acceptance, which was difficult because I was gripping the seat, but in that moment, I shifted. My perspective shifted. I knew that, okay, I can't control this plane. I really can't control life either. So I get back to the States. And I'm steady practicing, working through, mending my heart, showing up, 
Like, okay, I gave myself like five minutes a day to be sad and to sulk and like, oh my God, it shouldn't be like this. I still want to be with her. Oh my God. Five minutes. And then I would sit, meditate, go to the gym. And then one morning in March, after meditating, I woke up, I went outside. I heard the birds chirping. I felt the sun kissing my skin. I felt the wind dancing across my beard, like these little strands of hair was just like. And something within me said, welcome to today. Finally, I had gotten to a place where all my practice, all my tools that I was using had paid off and I was just here. And I learned how to just be here. But as I'm teaching my daughter now in this phase of my life, the things that you started, you start practicing in phase one, you have to practice in phase 10 as well. You can't forsake or abandon the fundamental tools. So I'm learning to let go of expectations. I'm learning to let anybody else learning to let go of expectations. Learning to let go of expectations, accept, accepting reality and accepting the way things are is incredibly hard. It's incredibly hard. But like I told uh, Cody, I love the expansiveness of this space, but also the intimacy of this setting in this moment, because what I've learned is if we want to master the mac the micro macro, we have to learn to master the micro. And so with acceptance, we're going to practice today with learning to just accept this moment. So if you would feet flat on the floor, I invite you to join in this practice with me. And maybe you uh, cup your hands in your lap or you place them on your knees. And I'm gonna ask that you sit tall. You straighten your back, square your shoulders. We wanna find the balance between effort and relaxation. We're not forcing anything, we're not trying, but we also wanna practice with intention. I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes. And if you're going to keep them open, allow your gaze to be soft, looking down at the ground. Now there is a lot of stuff happening in this space right now. And quite naturally, as it is with the monkey mind, is going to try and focus on everything that's happening. But the first tool I wanna to give back to you is your breath. Find your breath. And investigate what it's doing right now in this moment. Is it long and steady or is it fast and choppy? Whatever it is, see if you can let that be okay. We're not trying to change the breath or force the breath to be anything, it's not. Just accepting what it is, right? This is your breath in the same way that this is your practice and this is your life. We'll do a quick body scan I know the sun is out, but let's see if we can relax that part of our eyebrows we tend to wrinkle when we're focusing and when we're concentrating. Let your gaze be soft and your approach delicate. Moving down to the jaw. See if you can unhinge that allowing the tongue to rest softly in the mouth, letting it fall away from the roof. And maybe you allow your shoulders to fall away from your ears.
scanning down to the chest, allowing that to be soft and open. To your abdomen. To your lower back. Sinking deeply. Now this is the part where it starts to get tricky because as your body and your mind start to connect, there's going to be certain sensations that start to pop up, certain impulses, certain distractions and judgments that pop up. It could be something that happened 10 years ago, something that happened yesterday. It could be the sun beating down on us right now, or a bead of sweat, or an itch, an impulse to open your eyes, to move. See if you can breathe through those while staying connected to your breath and choosing to find stillness in this moment. Become intimate with your breath, curious even. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. And maybe you say, this is my in-breath. This is my out-breath. Staying with the breath. And maybe in this space that you've cultivated, you investigate it. What are we resisting? Is there any active resistance in this practice? Is there any resistance showing up in the body? Ask yourself if you can let go. your choice. Maybe even you say, I choose to let go. I choose to let go. Choose to let go of grasping to the way that things should be. Clinging to the way that things used to be. I choose to let go of expectations. 
I choose to let go of the illusion that I can control. I choose to stop resisting. choose to let go of what no longer serves me, those habits, those pints of ice cream at midnight, those beliefs. A couple of years ago, I was in class at Chattanooga State. And it was the winter time. And as I exited the building, a cold front hit me. And it was raining. And I was resisting. I was judging. I was angry. I started to walk fast, trying to get to my car. And the faster I walked, the more wet I became, the colder I grew, and immediately I stopped. I said, you know what? It's December. Of course it's gonna be cold. And it's raining. Of course I'm gonna get wet. And when I accepted those two truths, my attention shifted from my condition and my experience to reality. There were still birds outside and I could still hear them. The fact that I could even feel cold let me know that I was still alive. I saw the trees naked and dancing with the wind. And somehow I stopped being cold. That moment of acceptance gave me clarity, but it also allowed me to enjoy the shifting seasons. Things are going to change as fast as they stay the same. Your breath will be with you, your ability and power to let go will stay with you. And when you need them, hopefully you go to your toolbox and you pull these out. And as we move towards the end of this practice, maybe you take one more grounding breath, wiggle your fingers and toes, open your eyes. Welcome to today. Thank you for your time.